audience or raise your hand. I see we have some familiar faces. All right, guys, this is a super ghetto live version today because I'm I'm literally just holding the phone up to the mic. <laughs> oh, my God. So if this doesn't go well, it doesn't go well. But, um, Patrick, good to have you. I know you guys have already jumped into the conversation here, but it seems like I haven't talked to you for a while, and I think I talked to you right at the beginning of the, the pandemic. Um, right. You were down in Florida or somewhere. Where are you based out of? Chicago. Chicago. That's right. I just remember it, it looked it looked gray <laughs> there. So, Florida, now, Chicago. What's the difference? Yeah, and what what we're seeing now is as people come out of the pandemic, um, people are starting to reinvest. People are starting to budgets are starting to open back up, and people are starting to make those strategic investments uh, into new markets. Um, what does that look like at Rotary International as we go into twenty twenty one and like for the next three years? What are your guys' plans there? Yeah, it's, it's it's no different because we you know again we went through a phase of, of like really looking into you know what was going to happen right to our organization overall and, and we kind of all had to hold our horses a little bit and, and watch and see what would unfold but actually luckily as I was just mentioning uh, we we have been busier than ever so we are now looking into 2021 and, and moving forward as a good opportunity to the new structures of our, our organization so that means that we have to, to make some more events in terms of tools that we're going to use and, and platforms that we're going to use you know for us um of course virtual interpretation has been very it's been you know booming more than ever for us in all the meetings that we have so now in terms of, of what the future holds is looking at this new world of, of, of the you know the blended experience of person and virtual and, and making the right investments to support us in this new world. What does that look like, blended experience? Give us some specific um, examples. Yeah, yeah. So for us, for example, um, we, we rely very heavily on in in-person meetings, right? From our committees to the club meetings that happen every day to our you know, annual convention that has thousands of people. But now we're looking into the experience to see you know, it's going to be, it's not going to be a one size fits all anymore. I think we're going to, we're going to take more advantage of, you know, live streaming technologies and opportunities as we go back to having in person large events. It is going to be in that, you know, hybrid mode of it is in person, but the, the virtual components of those events, I'm sure, are going to be much stronger than what they were in the past because folks are more used to it. And, and there are advantages and disadvantages of, of either the in person or virtual world. But I think that blended experience of, you know, the flexibility of being there in person or not um, doesn't mean necessarily that you have to miss out on, on content and what's going on. Makes sense. Liz, we got you. I'm not a moderator, Liz, so I can't see if anybody's raised hands. Can you make me a moderator? And can you also make you a moderator? It's like we're here. Um, I see that Tanya. Gabriela, for inviting me. Um, I have a really practical question. How the heck are you recording this? <laughs> well, we had it down to a, a, a interesting science, but it's uh, we're, we were we have run into some difficulties this week. Uh, Tucker has got a whole whole system in place yeah that's right so normally well, we're live streaming this on facebook linkedin youtube twitter and it, it, it's it's quite the event and like at the last minute i think they pushed a software update because they're not letting me run my my iphone um through here anymore so they're on to us guys they're pushing updates quicker than we can keep up with them <laughs> did you have a question yeah did you have a question for patrick me? Now, did you have a question for Patrick? Um, no, it was just a practical question. I, I'm new here, so I'm just... Okay. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming up on stage. Good to have you. Yeah. Awesome. Who else we got, Liz? I see Julia has come up. Julia, hi. Hello. I'm back. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> it's good to have you.
remember what event it was, but I know you were, we were at, at the same event. Um, so I was interested in um, what you said at the beginning when you were introducing yourself and how you are set up at Rotary, that you have a hybrid model with um, internal um, linguists uh, who are also not just linguists, but they're also interpreters, and then you have external ones. I just and I wanted to know more about all these, like the, the external ones. Are they freelancers? Is it a mix of freelancers and LSP resources? And the internal ones, I'm fascinated by the fact that you have people who can also do interpretation. So how does recruiting look like for you? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, so for me, I started when I started Rotary in 2009, um, we were called language services. And basically the main functions of the group was basically translation and interpretation. And it has evolved to now global communication. We have, we have a slightly different approach. Um, but when I started, um, it was interesting because I remember that most of the work was done internally. Even though there was a budget to, to outsource, um, most of the work was done internally. And the, the, the outsourcing of the work was done fully by freelancers. And as we developed into global communications in 2015-16, I, I had the opportunity to kind of rebrand the team and think about some strategic approaches to to, to, to that group. Um, we took a deep dive into our processes, our workflows, and, and, and basically what was working, what was not working. And we, we decided that we needed to embark uh, and folks might have heard me say this before, and I could, we, I felt like we were pretty much under a rock in terms of the industry overall. We're, we're operating in a very old school manner, and we're not being able to catch up, and um, and with with the trends of, of, of the times. And then what we did is in, in our analysis, we we decided to keep the house team, and uh, it's an interesting process because if we bring somebody in house. Um, we used to have a structured, now we haven't um, had it in, in, in a while because we, we formed great interpreters, but we used to have an internal uh, training for interpreters. So folks who wanted to be to become so interpreters could go through that training. And I, I was actually one of them when I started. Um, I trained to become an interpreter in this internal in-house program that we had, and that's actually something I miss a lot. Oh, wow. And, um, and we were able to then, you know, am amplify the skills of folks. So, and as part of that process, okay. um, we, we kept, so not everybody, of course, wants or, or, or could be an interpreter. So not everybody in the team is, but half of the team pretty much uh, can do interpretation. And for outsourcing, we work, um, for interpretation, we have freelance interpreters, uh, mostly that have been working with us for many, many years. And for the localization side, we have uh, some freelance interpreters, but part of our strategy was to secure one or two LSPs uh, to partner with us. Right now we have one LSP that we work with, and, and it was interesting because that LSP came on board um, when I was managing quality. We brought them on board to help us with quality assurance, and um, eventually that, that partnership grew into also they doing, them doing work for us for localization. So it's, uh, it works very well. Um, and, and so now that's why we, it's truly hybrid because we have freelancers, we have LSPs, and um, we have the folks in house that, um, and mainly the, the main thing about looking for an LSP had to do with the fact that with the new branding of the team, we wanted the team to focus on other things so than, than localization and interpretation. So it had to do with content creation, social media management. So we had to alleviate a lot of that burden of the volume that the team had and outsource more to be able to have a successful model. That's, uh, that's great to hear. It's really fascinating too. And the type of interpretation that you were teaching, is it just consecutive interpretation or were you able to do simultaneous? No, only simultaneous. Both simultaneous. We, we operate mostly simultaneous, mostly simultaneous but oh, wow. the training included consecutive and simultaneous. But most of our meetings, it's all simultaneous. I am super impressed. Thank you. Very Thank impressive. You. I love it. All of our guest speakers are sharing the love here today. Thank you, Julia. Looks like Rodrigo has joined us on stage as well. Hey, Rodrigo. 
Haley's, Patrick, Hi. Tucker, Hi, Julia, Tanya, and how's everyone? Hope Very all great. is good. I wanted to ask Patrick uh, actually two questions. Um, I'm really curious about the content type that you guys actually translate. What, what sort of, you know, what do you translate? <laughs> yeah. And the second one, sorry. Um, you, Julia mentioned one thing that's uh, uh, quite curious. I'm always very curious whenever, uh, whenever uh, you know, localization structures have uh, internal resources, in-house resources. So I was wondering what uh, is exactly their um, their their job. Are they like language champions? Are they like LQA holders, if you prefer? Do they make sure that uh, the the, the quality of their particular language is up to expectations. Yeah. So in terms of content type, thank you for the for, for your question. Yeah. In terms of content type, um, we are large again the organization that supports you know thirty six thousand clubs around the world. So um, all the communications we in the global communications and design teams we are we are embedded within the communications group overall. There's you know, the whole communications group has around one hundred and ten staff. Um, but in terms of, of what we we localize, we translate, uh, it's pretty much everything under the sun for the organization from um, publications that we use in trainings uh, to agenda to meetings to um, legal documents to finance documents to pretty much everything that we need to operate from marketing. We do a lot of trans creation um, for marketing materials. We do from the communication side, we, we translate or we create or curate content um, for, you know, brand positioning, for, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, you know, determinations that are being made in the organization. Um, our organization has a lot of committees, um, operations committees, strategic planning committees. So um, all of that, because we're a global organization, you know, gets translated in our main languages. Um, we have a board of directors that has representatives from um, all, all around the world. So. Um, you know, for membership development, membership campaigns, so you name it, everything pretty much under the, under the sun um, is done in, in our main languages to, to be able to operate as a global organization. Um, and in terms of um, what the team does, right, so it's interesting because as I mentioned, like we rebranded, so one of the things is that, okay, we, 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 we don't want to be uh, translators anymore, basically, and, 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 and what I mean by that is, uh, the team had a lot of the skills to do more than that. So right now, the official title of members of the team is, is regional communication specialists. And they do from the translation editing to quality assurance uh, to also, um, again, creating content. They write blogs. They write stories. Uh, they work with our magazines to, to pitch stories to, to a global scale. So everything used to be pretty much top down, like from the US centric out. Uh, but so as, as I mentioned, Rotary is a true uh, global organization because regardless of what we decide here in headquarters, because the experience happens every single day in 36,000 clubs around the world. So it's truly a global, global organization. So um, the team does, yeah, does every, everything again, from interpretation to translation to quality control um, to, to content creation, content curation um, is part of what the team does. And one very important thing for us when we rebranded it, was to be also to also move from the end of the tail, right? That which we know is, is very common in, in many localization programs that localization is kind of an afterthought, right? So things happen and then it's like make it work. So for us, by rebranding uh, from language services to global communications, we were able to establish ourselves as strategic partners. So that's one of the most important things about our team. You know, we have groups of SMEs that actually sit in, in, in enterprise projects or corporate projects uh, when the projects are being developed. So that's very important to us to be able to be at the table and offer a global perspective as things are getting developed, instead of just waiting at the end of, of the tail to to be told to to offer services. So we shifted that that approach from being you know, order takers or, or, or service providers should be strategic partners. That's also very important to us. Yeah, that's great. Great, great. That's, that's, I think that's the ambition of any localization program uh, it's, uh, to establish relevance. Um, uh, yeah. uh, I want 
wanted to ask you, I was quite curious also on the back of what you, of what you mentioned about their involvement uh, in, in uh, multilingual uh, copywriting, for example, which you know, derives from what you mentioned about content creation. How big is their involvement or, you know, or do you go outside the internal structure uh, for, for content creation? And are you doing it multilingually as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically the team uh, has that. And we started with, with uh, I mean, with baby steps. Um, one of the, the first steps that we did was to take on the blogs. So the blogs that we had were basically all translated. And, and as we were able to rebrand, we, we separated that, we split. So we're able to create our own blog. So the team actually goes after the stories. It's a very interesting process. We have now an editorial board within the team that has de dedicated people looking at content. So either by creating the content from scratch, like finding a story of a project somewhere that has, you know, that supports our our strategic, our action plan and all that, and, and bringing that to light through the blogs or social media or writing an article to the web um, or also working with uh, members of the organization out there to see if they have contributions, if they want to contribute to content and then the team functions more as, as curators of content or editors of the content. Um, that's mostly the work that we do uh, in terms of creating content. And then there's some, um, one of the things that we did as we went through this rebranding was to add one member, uh, an extension of our team to each of our international offices. We have six international offices or offices outside of the US, I should say. And we were able to expand and, and, and the scope of the, what the team does and also have a communications person on the ground that either again works with members to write stories or works with our magazines to create campaigns or create stories and also helps in terms of uh, brand position and training for our members. So it, it's it's a collaborative kind of work that's done by the in-house team uh, with our regional magazines and with our members themselves. So for us, that's very important to be collaborative as much as we can. Can I ask a follow-up question to this? Sure. Um, so, do you still do some translated content for your blogs, uh, or is it gone completely original content for various um, locales? That's a very good question, uh, Julian. Now, we do both. So, for example, there are some types of content. Uh, that was another thing that shifted for us, because in our previous environment, in our previous website, we, we did a, we did a, a revamping of our website previously we were tied to the English, right? So basically, English content pretty much had to be translated in all languages for it to be published. That was a, it was a... Um, but then when we revamped the website and we launched the blogs, we now have freedom to say, you know, this type of story, for example, we're gonna do um, in French and German because it's really relevant to that region, but we're not gonna do it in Japanese. We're gonna post a so, uh, an original content for the blog in Japanese. So right. it's a hybrid as well. It's a blended uh, model there because there are some what types we, of content. We for example, from we're talking about a, ma a massive campaign about polio, which is our flagship program, the polio eradication program. So those types of content sometimes uh, will get done in all the language. So it's still, it's still a, a, a good, a good yeah. um, blending of, of both. Yeah, it's it's the same for us where we, we have the same model as Shopify. So do you also do, so do you sometimes have original content created in a language that's not English and then you'll get that content translated in another non-English language because, it, you know, for example, you have something done in you realize it could be useful in French and Spanish and Italian, and so you just... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we do that now. And, and, yeah. and we do also... And sometimes the content, that was very important to us to shift that model from English to, to everything else to be more fluid. And sometimes we have content that, you know, we might our team might be working with a story with a magazine in Argentina, and that story is really great. So our, our American right. magazine will pick up that story and recreate the story in English or other yeah. languages. Yeah. yeah, it's great. That's great. I am sorry, sorry uh, comment on that, Patrick. Yeah, I, I, you know, it shows uh, the, the way you've empowered your internal um, uh, resources and linguists shows a, a high, high degree of, of maturity. Uh, uh, absolutely. So, so congratulates on uh, on that. I think sometimes when you when you have uh, internal or in-house resources, it's really tough 
um, to establish a you know career path where people are actually satisfied. So so congrats on that. It's just a Thank comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was it was a tough journey. It was right. I, I gotta say, you know, for us. You know, when I was given this opportunity, it was in passing conversation with my boss's boss. And it's like, you know, what would you do differently if you had the opportunity to do whatever you wanted? And I'm like, it's interesting you ask. Let me let me pitch you a, a, an idea. And and he really enjoyed it. And, and and when he said, OK, let's make it happen, I'm like, OK, oh, shoot. Now what? Right. Where do we, where do we start? But it's been a good journey. And I've been I'm very fortunate to have great, you know, partners in, in my team, a great team of, of leaders that have really embraced the idea and it hasn't been easy, it hasn't been painless, but it's paying off and we're still, you know, we're still growing, we're still developing and, and we enjoy the journey so far. And do you guys have plans to expand into additional languages or other markets? Uh, yes, uh, we do. Um, one thing that has, you know, for us, when we add a language, it's, it's, it's interesting. We have our own, you know, everything generally is dictated by our board of directors. Our board is composed by volunteers. Um, they will make a pitch for a language and the board will then decide and we get involved in conversations and we have to support, you know, providing information to help the board make a decision. But um, one language that has increased for us a lot is, is um, uh, traditional Chinese has been, has been, we have a, a huge um, membership in, in Taiwan. And um, so that has increased in the past few years. We added a dedicated staff person to that language. Uh, we're actually very fortunate because we had somebody in our team who was in the Japanese, part of the Japanese team and was actually Chinese and, and navigated both languages. So that person now only dedicates to, it's interesting because she dedicates her time to localization in Chinese, but interpretation in Japanese. So we, oh, wow. We, we, yeah, it's, it's very good. She's, she's great. and and. We are we have increased budget for outsourcing and traditional uh, Chinese, and for us, we are always keeping an eye on what's going on because mainland China it still doesn't have Rotary clubs. The government doesn't allow uh, that yet. Um, there are a few uh, clubs of expats in mainland China, but we believe that uh, that that could soon change. And and if that changes, we know that's going to be a big demand for us in terms of the market. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, uh, quick question. Um, uh, Patrick, in, in, in a not-for-profit organization like, like Rotary, um, how big or is the pressure uh, to present re return on investment, to present localization ROI in the, let's say, you know, traditional sense of, of justifying the existence of, of such a function? Yeah, it's, it's huge. Uh, from time to time, um, our board calls us and just like, you know, questions, right? So we have somebody who might say, you know, we should outsource everything or we should, um, you know, um, or we should do everything. It's interesting. Or we should do every, absolutely everything under the sun in every language out there. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's an interesting balancing act to be able, it's a lot of pressure to, to you know, again, justify our existence and, and, that, that was one of the drivers for us in rebranding our team because we part of part of my thought was that we could we could bring more value and we could showcase more value if we went that route and uh, we've been successful so far but from time to time um, personally I will do um, I will do you know case studies and, and, and keep it in my back pocket in terms of what would the operations look like if we were to go this direction or that direction or um, you know, and, and show the, the value, of course, not only, again, from the localization standpoint, but content creation, but also interpretation, right? What would it cost? Well, how much would it cost if we were to outsource everything? Or if we were, so every now and then I create those those study, you know, cases in, in my in my head, in my computer to keep it in my back pocket because we, we get called to to speak to, to that from time to time. So it's a, it's a constant exercise for me. Thank you for those questions. I can always count on you to have these really <laughs> questions here on Clubhouse. Um, that was awesome.
anyone else in the audience like to come up and ask Patrick any questions or be involved in the conversation, um, please feel free, raise your hand, and I will bring you up. But, but as always, we're here together talking about the intersection of language and culture and growth and all that goes into expanding internationally. And thank you, Patrick, for joining us and telling us about this that you have put together. It looks like Renato is coming up to speak with us, which is an honor. All right. Hi, Renato. Oi, Patrick. Uh, Oi, Renato. I see, I see that we have the Brazilian and the Portuguese mafia getting together here. <laughs> and, and by the way, for those who don't know, Trader Joe's now sells don't queijo. So, uh, the, uh, the question that I have, Patrick, is in terms of, of um, mar specific challenges, what, what is the most difficult? Uh, I, 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 I don't know if I should use the word market, what is the most difficult geography for for you? Uh, you mentioned China with the barriers to being able to access and, and provide everything that you want to. But uh, uh, with the exception of China, what else is, what, what would be a, an unexpectedly hard market for you? It's interesting, and I'll just say that because it, it's very ironic because we, we watch membership trends for organizations. Um, every month to see how it goes. And, and actually, in terms of, of growth or, or not, uh, the U.S. actually is, is a market where the organization has seen some decline, uh, very interestingly, because it was, it was originated in the U.S. Um, and now we're going through um, an exercise to uh, you know, expand or, or be more flexible in terms of um, our membership structure and what we offer in terms of, of services for, for our members. But the U.S. has been been the, the very challenging uh, type of market for us. And in Latin America, uh, it, it goes through a lot of ups and downs, um, especially that the, the uh, Hispanic part of, of Latin America goes through some ups and downs. Uh, Brazil is pretty, tends to be very strong. Uh, but we will see now with COVID, we anticipate in some areas might suffer more than others. And, and yeah, it's interesting to see how some areas are kind of booming and, and some others not so much. So yeah, I would say the U.S. and Latin America are tough for us in terms of market, in terms of ups and downs. So when you say the U.S. from a translation perspective, is it a, a tough market? How many languages do you make for the United States? No, no. The, the U.S. for us is, is tough in terms of keeping our clubs. Our clubs are more old school. Um, we, 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 it's, which is interesting for us in terms of, of um, a language perspective. Our main challenge has been, and we've been able to, we were able to, Fix some of that uh, with our global content team was we got we got we used to get a lot of criticism um, because there was no treatment to to the English content and of course we had a heavy criticism that our, our tone and voice was extremely Americanized so in other parts of the world like Australia and you know, the UK and others so we were able to from a language perspective to to mitigate some of that by offering uh, part of our team to be focused on the English content. Um, for the U.S. overall, the, the, the main challenge is, is in membership in, in general because of the, the structure of the clubs here. And, and um, not every club has been able to be as flexible as we'd like them to be. But I think there is a wake-up call going on right now with the U.S. And uh, things, conversations are changing and things are changing overall. So we'll see. Hopefully it will change. Thank you so much for jumping in, Renato. Patrick, this is Tucker. I'm back. I I, I do apologize. I've been uh, trying to. I've had the, my phone buried underneath a microphone <laughs> to try uh, to try to um, fix this audio issue that we have on the live stream. But thank you, thank you very much for those of you that are joining on the live stream. Um, if if you're joining us, I apologize for the the audio issues. We're here talking to Patrick Nunez. Is it Nunez or Nunez? I know I've asked you this before, Patrick. <laughs> Nunez, because when I went to look at your name, I was like, where's the N-yay? Maybe it's right. Nunez. Okay, so Patrick Nunez from Rotary International. Um, 
this room every week we talk about localization translation go to market strategy uh, global expansion all of the things we are a very inclusive group here um, come on up stage and ask a question um, come on up stage and share a story this is this is a conversation it's not a webinar that's the beautiful thing about clubhouse and that's why Liz and i love doing this every week on clubhouse um, for example renato just came up and asked a question i think he saw me struggling here <laughs> <laughs> with the with the technical components who else we got on stage liz i haven't even looked um uh, we're coming on up come on How is um, your language technology landscape looking like for the next couple of years? Oh, yeah. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, that's, that was also a big component for us when we were uh, rebranding our team. As I mentioned, we were pretty much under a rock for the longest time. Um, we we had a very broken, very broken um, in-house made um, um, transition management system or workflow management tool. And uh, when I first started a rotary, we used some, um, machine transition and transition uh, and transition memory, but leadership at the time, very like, I would say 2010 or so decided to pull the plug on all that pretty much overnight. And we were pretty much under the rock and in the dark ages, as I would say for the longest time. So for us, it was really important as we were, again, rebranding and looking into capacity and, and cause again, we, we were very ambitious to do other types of work, right? Keeping the same staff without adding headcount. So part of the strategy, as we were looking at our processes and how we were doing things, because we wanted to be very honest about how we were doing things and most importantly, why we're doing things the way we're doing part of that um, equation had to rely on us bringing technology back uh, to help us. And for us, it was not, it was, it was an interesting process because it was not about just picking up what's the, what's the shiniest object on the shelf, right? Cause we, we knew there was a, there, there were a lot of uh, options and offerings for technology out there, but for us, it was really important to really did do a deep dive and see what would help us how. Um, so after some time, going through that exercise, we were able to bring, um, you know, um, transition memory back and, uh, more machine translation tools. And we were able to select, uh, a new, uh, workflow management system, which was an interesting process for us because we, uh, first and foremost, we wanted to make sure that the management, uh, the transition management system we had was not just to manage translation. We had, a lot of workflows that were, you know, entangled with the design team and others. So we have been very successful and it's been a long journey, but we we're able to pick somebody that was pretty new to the market, um, but was willing to grow with us and was willing to, to hear what we needed. And right now that management system that we have is, is employed for all the communications types of requests that we have. So we're able in the back end. So let's say somebody requests a new video. We're able to embed workflows for localization and create social media asset workflows and all that within the same tool. So for us, I think it's looking very promising as we're expanding the usage of that tool um, in a way that we don't have to sacrifice or be confined in a box of translation management systems that rely solely on, you know, source language, target language, and other things. So I think um, we 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 have been able to pretty much. Um, I would, I want to say fast track, but we have been able to kind of walk pretty, pretty, you know, fast through the localization maturity model and get us where we needed to be. So I think in the future technology is looking, we're looking much better than when we were, you know, in 2015 or 16, that's for sure. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, yeah, I don't want to go into too much, too, too much detail. Uh, I was just, I'm also very curious about. You know, uh, you mentioned machine translation. Um, 
was just thinking about the use case for you guys in particular mm-hmm. for for machine translation. You know, um, what would that look like? Yeah, so it's it's interesting because for the longest time, again, uh, I think uh, you know previous leadership um, didn't look very favorably towards machine translation, and um, we have been able to to adapt, adapt and adjust. And it was an interesting change of management process for us because that mentality or, or that that perspective was very much of resistance to, to machine translation. Well, so we why, to why was that, Patrick, if, if you don't mind? Why, yeah. why was there that yeah, resistance? Absolutely, yeah. yeah, there was this concept, there was this idea, you know, very old school mentality that, you know, machine translation was um, meant for quality, um, that we, we will never sacrifice yeah. quality. And that hasn't changed. We're, we're never going to sacrifice quality. However, we found uh, a way to evangelize and, and be able to... Um, adapt and, and adjust in terms of what types of content right go through machine translation what circumstances we use machine translation like for example if it's content that is going to be done generally done into english because it's somebody some staff that kind of wants to take a look at you know get a gist of what's going on we will use that and do post editing right so if something that's not going to see pretty much the light of the day um we do a quick post editing and, and off it goes yeah. um it's so, good good enough so to speak correct yeah exactly it so, makes so sense. it's been interesting and it's been a good journey for us on that too that's a good question thanks patrick i'm gonna shut up now <laughs> <laughs> no please don't this is good thank you <laughs> Um, hi, Marina. I see you've joined us and come up to the stage. Good to see you or hear you, I should say. I didn't even know. Um, I'm hearing wonderful uh, conversation about all kinds of localization things, of course, and uh, I kind of missed the biggest portion of what y'all talking about. <laughs> well, <laughs> honey, <laughs> we have Patrick Nunez here with us from Rotary International telling us about his program and the team that he's built and uh, and their localization initiatives over there. And one of my first questions for him had been, you know, how has the Rotary International, these clubs, you know, how has that shifted because of COVID? And, uh, and we've kind of gone from there. So it's been a really good conversation. I, I will say, Marina, we have not gotten to a point where we've discussed any sort of food. This- oh, darn. I, I, I have a question. I'm sorry. I'm balancing microphones here. So, um, Patrick, what um, – you guys have a, a very unique situation. Well, don't we all, right? We always have a unique situation um, at every organization. But what, and I don't want to say competitors, but what other organizations, companies, brands, not-for-profits, NGOs, what are the closest, um, like, parallels to what you do and the challenges that you face? Are there other organizations out there that face the same challenges? And what have you done to, like, collaborate with them, if anything? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. We have the Lions Club International. Right. Right. Um, which is also headquartered in the Chicagoland area. It's a very interesting story because Lions uh, started um, way back when, uh, uh, not too far behind from Rotary. Uh, We started in 1905. I think they started a few years later. And actually, it's an interesting story because they were were started by a former Rotary member who didn't agree with, with what Rotary was doing and started his own. And uh, Lions has, has grown uh, uh, exponentially also around the world with the same model of clubs and all that. So, and, and they are uh, they are actually uh, in another suburb here in the Chicagoland area. And that was another very important point to me when we were rebranding was to reach out to them. And, and today we have a great a great um, um, friendship with them because we we by talking, you know, we found out that we had similar challenges and similar opportunities. So actually, you know, pre-COVID, we would um, a few times a year have joint um, professional development days that we would bring them over to us. We would go there to their headquarters and we would organize discussion. We had our own pretty much conference for a day or two. Um, so we, we keep in touch with them because they, they have very similar 
uh, structure and all that. So for us, it's become, you know, it was more of like a, an unheard relationship. And now it's a very close relationship with their, their folks that run the localization program. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah, I was just curious because I'm, I'm always fascinated to hear about these these collaborations between multiple and different organizations. And it is something that, you know, in the language services industry, localization, whatever industry you identify with, it's this concept of coopetition, right? Like even our competitors, we cooperate with. It's a small industry. And this is true um, not just on the, the vendor side, but on the buyer side as well. And I've gotten the opportunity to be on the fly on the wall in some really fascinating conversations where big brands get together, kind of like in secret, behind the scenes. You know, you don't hear about it. And yeah, that's, and I've been thinking about this and preparing for the Rotary. It's like, who, who do you talk to when, when you yeah. want to talk to someone? So. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, uh, we, we find it very valuable valuable to, to exchange those ideas and thoughts and learn and you know they might implement a tool that we might ask what you know how's it going does it really work for you or whatnot and vice versa so yeah it's very valuable great well thank you guys we've got a couple minutes left here does anybody have any additional questions for patrick i have a quick question here sir Unfortunately, my internet keeps jamming up on Clubhouse today, so I don't yeah. know if I had heard, Patrick. Um, some, some Clubhouse technical issues as well today. I'm not sure what happened. It, it may not, it's not just you. <laughs> as I'm here holding an Probably. iPhone in front of a microphone, real fancy technology today, guys. Yeah, there's something going on. I think they just pushed an update, so. Oh, okay, very good. But anyway, um, Patrick, so. I, I don't know if you had already spoken to it, but uh, Rotary being um, a communication vehicle like Toastmasters International is, is, you know, like a leader in promoting best practices in public speaking and, you know, creating training and that kind of thing. And it's interesting, I've been involved in Toastmasters and seen their localization just barely start to come to life and they moved headquarters from California. And in doing so, they all of a sudden invested a lot of money and effort into localization properly. They actually have a department now and that kind of thing. So can you speak to uh, Rotary's um, evolution? Has it always been solid with localization? Uh, you probably talked about this earlier. Yeah, no, this is good. And it's interesting you mentioned to us, Massey, because we, we last year or two years ago, we actually have a corporate partnership with Toastmasters. And I had the chance to speak to their localization, newly formed localization leadership at the time. Um, and they have, yeah, that's, you're absolutely right. They have really increased and, and solidified their structure in terms of that. And actually came to us for, for a, few, a few things. And um, yeah, for Rotary, it's been, yeah, it's been for the, the that's one good thing that really helped us, you know, rebrand because the, the previous language services team was around for the longest time. So before my time, when I came in 2009, it, it, had, it had already been around for a long time uh, as a, as a, and it went through phases. I, my understanding is that way back when uh, those happened in our international offices. And then um, I would say probably 25 years or so ago, uh, they shipped them out and centralized everything in the world headquarters, which was very interesting. So for us, it's been it's been structured for for a long period of time that we had the function of, of uh, what was then language services or localization program. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Very interesting. Great. Any any other questions for Patrick? Here we guys. We got five minutes left here on this this crazy ride we've had today. Liz, thank you so much for driving this whole session today. And Patrick, yeah. thank you so no much for, for coming um, and, and being our, our honored guest in this brand new. This is this your first clubhouse room, Patrick? It is. Did I hear you say that earlier? Nice. Nice. So everybody here gets to witness. Everybody give Patrick a follow. That way, if he's on here, you can you can make sure to be keeping tabs on him. Do we have any last minute questions? Anybody from the audience would like to come on up before we uh, close her on up for the day? 
I see that's a no. So I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Clubhouse pushed that update, and I can't play all my fancy music and my applause and all that fun stuff today. But um, we'll virtually give Patrick a round of round of applause here. Thank you so much, sir, for coming and sharing your insight. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every time I talk to you, um, which isn't often, but I'm just amazed by by your experience. You you've been through it over there at Rotary and. Um, Anybody who would like to learn from Nate's experience, please make sure to follow him, reach out. And likewise, my co-moderator here, Liz Dunn Marcy, um, make sure to give her a follow and find her on LinkedIn. You can find myself on LinkedIn too. My name is Tucker Johnson. And with that, I think we'll we'll close it up here. Any closing remarks to my co-hosts, Patrick, Liz? I just want to thank you all. Thank you for having me. It's great talking to everybody here today. And I'm looking conversations thank you so much Absolutely. thank you for joining us patrick this has been a real pleasure all right guys we'll close it up we'll do one for the live stream we'll do one applause and we'll see you all next time have a great day y'all